This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. You know, I don't even want to belabor even a bit of the point. William White is back here to discuss the music and the orchestrations of Pacific Overtures. So let's get to that conversation right now. Will, thanks for coming back to the show. Oh, Kyle, my absolute pleasure as always. Thanks for having me. As I was kind of mentioning to you before we push record here, you're always my ringer. If I, if I need someone to join me like last minute, you're the person I ask. Uh, but of course, you are also very knowledgeable about the subject of orchestrations and like why music works the way it does. So I'm glad that you uh, had some time here today. Yeah, you know, this is a uh, this is a doubly hard assignment because, you know, as you mentioned, I am always happy at the drop of a hat to talk about anything related to the music of Stephen Sondheim. Now, the drop of this particular hat, th this is a hard one. Orchestrations yeah. of Pacific Overtures. This one I really had to uh, to use my my little time to kind of get my wits together and get my notes together and really think through what, what there is to say. But, but, you know, of course, there is a ton to say about it. Oh, lots. Well, let's start there first. I mean, of course, I know your love of Stephen Sondheim, but I want to talk about Pacific Overtures very specifically first. Uh, can you recall the very first time you heard Pacific Overtures? I can certainly recall the period in which I got to know it. I was in my early 20s. I was living in Chicago. I was conducting a youth orchestra. And I had totally, as I, the phrase I've used before, I had accepted Stephen Sondheim as my Lord and Savior. I was going through the shows. And of course, you know, Pacific Overtures for most people, and I am one of them, is not one of the first ones that you get into. Right. You know, you, you kind of got to go down the rabbit hole a little before you find this show. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing today and listening through the score, like I do remember the first time that I was listening through and the transition from, there is no other way into four black dragons. Is that good? And mm. and you get that huge, loud ringing, you know, and I remember yeah, like yeah. jumping out of my seat. But I, I was definitely taken by this show. I mean, it did not take much for me to just fall in love with it. And I remember it quite well because um, I was conducting this little youth orchestra in Chicago and I used to arrange music for them constantly. And, and one of mm. the pieces that I arranged for them was the advantages of floating in the middle of the sea. What an oddball thing to do. What a, what a strange thing for these, you know, youths yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to play an instrumental version of that song. But they loved it. They really got into it. The more I delve into the music of this show, I think when I initially got into it and started listening to it, I, I wouldn't have thought that some of this would actually work as just an orchestral piece. But now the more that I listen to it, it's like, actually, no, there's actually some great stuff in there that works very great or very well orchestrally. Uh, specifically, the one that you just called out. I actually think, I think Four Black Dragons you can use just as an orchestral piece. Um, and there's some other ones out there. They're just like, the music itself is just really great to I listen understand to. why that would be your first reaction too. Because, you know, as Sondheim talks about, what he was going for was a little bit of a minimalist approach. Because, I mean, he says, you know, right. Japan is the the par excellence, the minimalist culture. And he was using these kind of minimalist Japanese modes, you know, musical scales and stuff and the chord combinations. But it, it's it, it's so infectious. Like, you you can't you can't deny its charm. It's, it's great what yeah. he does. Like, this is the impossible question, because bas basically I'm asking you to psychoanalyze me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, do you think you understand why myself and a few other people I've talked with, like the initial time I got introduced to Pacific Overtures, I can't say it was, I, I, I guess I didn't have any strong emotions either way. It's not like I fell in love with it on first listen. I didn't hate it either, but it was just something like, I'm, you know what, I'm just not vibing with this 100%. But now it seems like, and I always call it like my Stockholm Syndrome every time mm -hmm. I do a new season of, of Sondheim, and maybe that's partly it. 
but it's it is one of those ones that the more I listen to each song, it's like, oh no, there's there's stuff here that I wasn't picking up on the very first time I listened to it, and now it's like, boy, there's some beautiful stuff that I adore from this show. Well, I mean, you know, if you're coming at this show from the perspective of somebody who loves Broadway musicals, it's certainly far afield. I mean, it is not yeah. the standard fare. I mean, you know, you don't you don't listen to like. Hello, Dolly and Annie, get your gun, and then come to Pacific Overtures. Uh, sure, sure. And and you know, there's mess- actually there's a kind of funny stories. I, I I always I never know how true these stories are, but there was a portion of the audience, at least in the opening week, who really thought that this was uh, a sequel to South Pacific that they were coming into. Oh, really? And it's like, ooh, boy, well, you're in for a, a treat if you think this is anything to do with Rodgers and Hammerstein. That, that would be an interesting uh, an interesting take for a director to do, though, to, to you know, <laughs> somehow tie it into, like, the expanded uh, right. South Pacific universe. And, uh, yeah. no, but, um, yeah, so it, it's, I mean, I can understand why that would be the initial reaction to a lot of people who love Broadway. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing about Stephen Sondheim is that he's a genius. And in that respect, I think there's a couple things. One is that as a genius, he always wants to roam. You know, he wants mm. to go from different broad ideas, big perspectives, um, and and sort of put his stamp in different corners. Like he did the whole Waltz show, and he did you know yeah. Greek tragedies, and um, he did you know the the, the great um, horror tragic violence right. show, right? And because of that. You know, he's going to apply his genius to these different concepts, and there's just going to be so much depth. There's going to be so much there to get. But, you know, Sondheim's very dense. He's doing mm-hmm. a different style, a totally different concept of what a musical can be. So, you know, you you, you got to give it a few listens before you're, you're really <laughs> going to connect, I think, with the show. As far as your research goes, how did this come to be? Like, how did Sondheim approach actually just writing the music for this show. Well, I think that some of your guests have talked about this a little bit. He, you know, Sondheim is famous for doing just like a little bit of research and then, but then mainly relying on, you know, his own musical language Mm -hmm. or his ideas and thought processes. And I think that's exactly what happened here. I mean, he and Hal Prince went to Japan. They saw some Kabuki and no theater. And um, one thing that I, I read about is that he got an LP of Japanese like no music or sort of ceremonial Mm. theatrical music and he had the liner notes translated they were it was all in Japanese Mm. and the the liner notes gave very specific notated uh, and and technical musical study in, in in western music theoretical terms so that then he that that was like his textbook of Japanese music theory His big takeaway, of course, was that the Japanese pentatonic scale, so that's a, a, a scale of five notes, which you find in cultures all over the world, but that the Japanese pentatonic scale was different in its sort of modality from the Chinese pentatonic scale, which is the very, like the most mm. broad um, caricature of what Asian music might sound like is this right. Chinese pentatonic scale, and that the Japanese one had a different kind of inflection and that that made him think of the guitar music of Manuel de Falla, who's the Spanish composer, and that because that that was his way in, because he knew de Falla pretty well, and and that that was like a Western Spanish flavor, got him into this mm-hmm. flamenco mood, and and so then he just sort of like was able to graft that onto the Japanese music. I, I it sounds very far fetched to me, but you know, creative artists they come to these things, these realizations, in all sort of different ways.
I love the idea of it being so culturally broad, right? This yeah. is, as Sondheim him, him, describes himself, like this white Jewish man from New York City flying to Japan only discovered that there's an in from a, a Spanish composer. So, like, there's there's a lot of stuff rolled into that. More power to him. He, he certainly got this done. It seems like we always bring up Jonathan Tunick every time you come on the show for good reason. He's a longtime Sondheim collaborator. Do, do you know anything about like how he approached finding the instruments, knowing which ones to use for this? Yeah, it's funny because Jonathan Tunick, if you read interviews with him, he will often cite company as being the hardest orchestration he had to do because he said mm. these songs were all sui generis. They sort of they they each represent their own new form and concept and musical style. And mm-hmm. so he had to create a new orchestral sound. You know, he couldn't just rely on the standard modes of Broadway orchestration. But I, I'm always shocked. I'm like, wait a second. What about Pacific Overtures? Like, right, you right, really right. had to figure out something new for this show. Um, maybe he just forgot about it. I don't know. He said that the entire creative team was sort of dragged kicking and screaming into doing this thing. And, yeah, and yeah. himself included. But he said that they, the challenge made them all rise to the occasion. And mm-hmm. that they all really lavished their best efforts, their their highest creativity on this thing, including Sondheim, including himself. I, I think that, you know, there was a study period, sort of like what Sondheim said. But I also remember seeing somewhere, and I wish I could call up this the, the source of this, but I believe that Paul Gemignani was actually a big help here as well. Mm. Uh, Gemignani, of course, Sondheim's go-to collaborator as a music director of, of his shows. But Gemignani was, and I guess still is to a certain extent, a percussionist. And the thing that you have to know about percussionists is they're all total gearheads. You know, I mean, like, whereas a violinist would spend their entire life trying to find the perfect violin and the perfect bow. You know, you just got to find like those two things and you experiment and you just get that one. Percussionists are like hoarders. You know, everywhere they go, anytime they go on a trip, they always come back with two or three different instruments because there are so many different instruments. There's there's not much standardization aside from like a snare drum. Even even that, there's like five, 20 different sizes, you know, and there's one that you use on the marching band field and there's the ones that you use in the orchestral, you know, excerpt or whatever. So percussionists are defined uh, even more than by their actual technique of playing it, how you might define a flutist or a violinist. They're defined by the actual gear that they have mm-hmm. so like like so many gearhead uh, percussionists Gemignani just had lots of instruments and i think that he brought in lots of sort of exotic not all necessarily japanese instruments but some asian instruments some yeah. probably native american or eastern european or brought in instruments from all over the place that they could kind of play around with and have as toys in the pit so i, I know that's one way that they came up with things I mean, this is such a a dumb question, but I am well documented for not being very smart when it comes to talking about this. When we think of the sound of Pacific Overtures, like, like as you said, you're coming in, possibly expecting this to be like your standard uh, Broadway musical. And, and I do want to say, like, in many ways, it still is a very much a Broadway musical, but the, the sound is very different than even previous Sondheim work. And I'm wondering if you can communicate why that is. Like, what is it specifically about this that makes it sound different? Well, this is the question that I was, you know, thinking like, boy, how am I going to define, you know, what is what is the orchestral color of this show? I mean, let's start off for the fact that there are three Japanese musicians on stage during this right. show. There's a shamisen player, and I believe then there's like two percussionists. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's like a bamboo flute. I mean, there is a bamboo flute mm-hmm. in this score, and I don't know if that person is on stage or off stage. These people, and and apparently the actual performers in the original Broadway cast, like only one of them spoke English. None of them really read music. I mean, they had to really figure out, and 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 they were used to accompanying kabuki and no theater, which is an improvised form. So right, they had right. to teach them certain things that, you know, were like themes from the show that they had to do at a certain time. But a lot of it, they were improvising on stage as they would in an authentic Japanese theater. So there is, a, I mean, you know, the, the whole show, the whole score starts with a shamisen, you know, plucking these notes. Right. It's a three note Japanese sort of guitar, for lack of a better term. So that's definitely in there. And then you've got the uh, the hyoshigi, the, uh, the little Japanese claves. 
you know, mm-hmm. ting, 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 that, that, that kind of sound. So that gives it the flavor right away. Now, in terms of what Jonathan Tunick is doing in the pit, you know, he, like I mentioned, he had these different toys in the percussion. He includes a lot of xylophone in this score. Like if you listen to all the climaxes, all the big builds mm. in the orchestra, almost always there's a, a xylophone going like a duka dicka duka dicka duka dicka duka or just with tremolos going, you know, just banging away at them. So some of these colors come through. Um, there's a lot of uh, flutes and note bends. You know, which which have that Japanese flavor. Pick a, sometimes the piccolo is in its very low range, which is unusual, and that gives it that kind of woody bamboo sound. So there's all sorts of stuff like that. But then I think the other thing to say is, and maybe we can talk about a few songs in particular. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, Jonathan Tunick is a genius orchestrator at the level of Sondheim, and that's of Sondheim as a composer, and, and that's what makes their partnership so uh, richly rewarding. And Tunick is a big believer in telling story through orchestration. So in a lot of these songs, you start with just the Japanese instruments or just a hint of little percussion in the pit or, um, you know, a flute in the background. And then slowly as the song goes on, the strings come in gets a little bit mm. warmer, gets a little bit more Western sounding, you know, and then the winds come in and then maybe you have some kind of big brass thing. So I think that that's also part of what defines the sound of this show. You're providing a pretty good segue here. Like for you, what is the standout song? Uh, whew. Boy, it, it you know, the, every song stands out in its own way. <laughs> Um, I, from an orchestration point of view, I mean, I think the easiest one to talk about almost would be the four admiral song, um, please. Hello. Please. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Because there you get bringing in more Western styles. I mean, that's, you know, I'm on, on firmer footing talking about how, how that works. Like you get the Gilbert and Sullivan pastiche parody. Right. It's like, this is very clearly in reference to them. Very clearly. And, and with the orchestration too. Now, you know what's funny about that song, though? You know, it starts with this big brass extravaganza, which is supposed to be like a John Philip Sousa march. But, you know, to me, it sounds like a bastardization of a John Philip Sousa march. It sounds like it's it's taking a, a Sousa and making it like as ugly and aggressive as it can with that big trombone slide up and down or yeah, excuse yeah. Me, down and up, I guess it is. Um, and, you know, it sounds like, yeah, it's it's it sounds like. John Philip Sousa made in its most aggressive American way as perceived through uh, the eyes of a Japanese person who's threatened by it. I mean, and that's the genius of Tunic to be able to do that. I have a lot to say about that song. I I love how it basically has a different pastiche for each of the four. Are they admirals or are they something? Whatever. The the four different people that kind of come in and out of that song, which is- Ambassadors, maybe. I don't know. Ambassadors. That's the word I'm trying to- Yeah. Yeah, Ambassadors. Uh, But there's, yeah, those quieter songs that are the ones I think I keep coming back to. Like I think of of, of a song like um, Poems or There Is No Other Way, Mm. which is like so subdued, but it's like, boy- well, I'll, let's just talk about There Is No Other Way first, mm-hmm. I guess, because there, I mean, I didn't do a deep listen, but it feels like there might be three instruments that are playing at that point. At, the, that. at the beginning, there are. You yeah. know, at the beginning, it's just, I think, the the shamisen and like, I don't know, mm-hmm. um, I think that's it. But man, the moment when the harp comes in yeah, and the strings yeah. come in and then it gently transitions into uh, more woodwinds and a fuller harmony. Oh, what what a delicate use of the coloristic palette. I mean, that is just first-rate craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a hard thing. I forget where I read this. This was years ago. It was not in relation to theater a lot. It was uh, movie making is what it was about. Mm -hmm. But it's like it actually takes a lot of skill to communicate something with the least amount of uh, stuff possible. Right. It's like sometimes you can lean in and like, well, you know what? We can do this big overblown like sweeping camera move or whatever it happens to be. It's like or can you do the same thing if we just keep them? Uh, uh, camera stationary and can we still get that same emotion out of there well it's like what Sondheim says about the hardest element of a musical is the book because you have to write so economically 
in order to keep the show flowing, get from musical number to musical number, and do everything you need to do in terms of plot, character development, uh, story arc, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two other songs that I just wanted to mention here, too. I mean, the one that just came out here very recently was Chrysanthemum Tea. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting song because the more I listen to that, it's like, it's really mostly just like a vamp underneath <laughs> the patter that's going on uh, with the Shogun's mother, but also using like the leitmotif of uh, four black dragons that had come out just before. So there's like, we have impending doom at the same time as like, the shogun's mother trying to communicate what she wants yeah I, I don't know if you have anything specific with that song but i kind of wanted to use that to also talk about other leitmotif moments in the show yeah well with that song specifically um there are some cool things in there which is like th the strings have portamentos which are slides in between the mm. notes you have to listen at a kind of deep level to hear those yeah but once you clue in on them you realize that that is adding so much atmosphere, you know, and so much mm -hmm. kind of japoniserie to the to the proceedings. <laughs> and then there's a couple other things in there, which is like the the blow winds parts, which I guess began as that song "Prayer" that was right, yes, cut and cut. then repurposed here. Um, the orchestration of that with the low bass clarinets and the string tremolos, you know, going back and forth really fast, which is often like kind of spooky music. But the way that those mm -hmm combined to into making a web together of orchestral colors just so cool and the other thing the thing that always stuck out for me in that song from the orchestra the use of this um like high electronic harpsichord ostinato you know when there oh. are ships in the bay and they want to go and there's just like bum 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 yeah don't bum bum Bum. Right, right. And the thing that, I mean, I always found that very annoying. Now I've come to love it. But um, <laughs> the thing that's funny about that is, you know, there is this story about Sondheim when he was writing the show. He was at dinner at Leonard Bernstein's house and uh, Bernstein got a call. He had to step away from the table and it was just the two of them. And apparently Bernstein had like a uh, a harpsichord in his dining room for some reason. And so Sondheim well, is just- of course he does. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So here's, here's Steve Sondheim left to his own devices and he's, you know, just got, he knows Bernstein. Sounds going to be on the phone for a few minutes. And so he just wanders over to the harpsichord. He starts plucking around on it. And he was like, oh, wait a second. You know, this this could kind of have a Japanese feel to it, too. I guess, you know, sort of mimic the sound mm. of the shamisen. And sure. and so he started like, I, I think that he like took his arms and he gently like crushed down on all of the notes of the harpsichord. And it made this kind of random plinking. And he uh, thought that he could use that somehow for the the score of the show. So the fact that the the little harpsichord comes up is interesting. But you know, I I can't say that I've ever traced the light motifs through this score. Mm. Maybe maybe you could uh, could shed a little bit more light on that. I I yeah I don't know. Like I I I know that there's that there's um when when I watched the, that the the film version of the 1976 original Broadway cast that you can find on YouTube. I think a lot of the interstitial music is interesting because it's not always like from the song that just preceded it. So it seems to like follow through uh, with uh, Menjiro and uh, Kiyama some, when they're coming back on stage and stuff like that. It's like, oh, it's interesting that they're bringing those themes back and this theme is coming here. But yeah, I don't know if I've done it like a huge deep dive <laughs> into it, into it either. What I, what I wanted to say, though, is that what I love about that story that you just told is one of my favorite things that happens when you read like the creation of whatever your your favorite art happens to be, which is like this random occurrence happened that completely changes the direction of this piece uh, that would never have happened otherwise, or very probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I I like that he just happened to cross paths with a harpsichord. And like, wait, wait a second, let me try. Sorry about jumping into the middle of the episode here, but I do need to tell you about some of the uh, people who help make this show continue to go. The first thing I need to tell you, and this is very exciting, we have three new patrons. So thank you for Joanne, Rob, and Russell for jumping on the Patreon page and helping support the show. I mean, if you would like to help support the show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in, and that's greatly appreciated. But if you would like to join those three other people and help this show monetarily, 
which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. And I also need to give a huge thanks to the God That's Good tier from Patreon, the triumphant quartet of Jack, Todd, Carrie, and Witty. Putting Together is also a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. First up this week is Pod Power. With Pod Power, our sponsors are making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This episode, Edmonton Community Foundation is helping us give a Pod Power shout out to Is This For Real? Is This For Real is a podcast about various facets of black life in Edmonton. In the first season of the show, Breaking the Blue Wall, host Omar Salafu explore anti-black racism and policing and tell stories about policing in schools, accountability in Alberta's policing system, and the impacts of police violence on black Edmontonians. You can listen to the podcast and read more about each episode at isthisforreal.ca. You can also support the work of these podcasters and future seasons on Patreon. This week we're also brought to you by ATB Cares. With ATB Cares, giving is easy. Donate through ATB Cares and ATB will match 20% of every dollar donated to eligible Albertan charities maximizing the impact of your donation. You can visit atbcares.com to choose your cause and donate today. I would say that nowadays, the most uh, quote unquote like popular song, or at least the song that I find gets the most coverage from this show is Someone in a Tree. And partly this is because Sondheim has gone on record that if I was to answer what my favorite song I wrote was, it's probably going to be this song. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he says that? Oh, I think he says that because he's taken with his own ability to do storytelling through music and through song. Mm. And, you know, of course, that song has a deep connection to a very famous Japanese movie, Rashomon, yeah, where, yeah. The, you know, you see the same event as seen through the eyes of four different people. And that's exactly what he does in that song. And I think that the other thing that he likes, you know, I, I read a little bit of an interview with him where he was talking about how I think Steve Reich really liked this uh, musical, you know, who's a very famous right. minimalist composer. And and he was complimented by that. In fact, they've done some some interviews together. Um, right. But uh, he was very satisfied with his ability to do a lot with a little in terms mm. of harmony, melody, song structure. I mean, you know, he builds the cathedral, as he often talks about, with just these tiny little motifs and, and, and just a few notes. And, and he says, you know, he uses cluster chords a, a lot, you know, no, uh, chords where the, the notes are very closely stacked together. And he says, right. you know, with a cluster, you just make one little change every four bars. And <laughs> because you're inside the modality of this song, that one little change counts for a lot. Whereas if, you know, if this was, you know, like a Brahms symphony, that one little change, you would hardly notice it. So um, I think that those are among the reasons why he likes it so much. And boy, I mean, I, I'm, I'm yeah. with him on that. It's, it's, it's oh, yeah. a freaking great song. It's a great song. Uh, that reminds me of this other interview I've watched online. It's specifically about Sweeney Todd. Mm. It, but it's kind of also why I like Stephen Sondheim, because he really doesn't like the whole like you're a genius moniker that mm -hmm. he sometimes uh, is is told with it's like here's the here's my trick everyone is like i i write this melody and then later on i decide like what if i made this um, um into a minor key and then you're labeled a genius <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right it's like he he he's being self-deprecating in that way but it's the 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 inverse of that is that sometimes doing that little thing like changing the one note or changing it from this to that inverting the, the notes or whatever you're, you're going to do uh, does have a big impact without having to be like grandiose about it. And there is there's, there's that subtle, I don't know, greatness to that just to be able to be like, oh, I can recognize I can just do this little thing. It's going to have this huge impact over here. Yeah, there's that. And to give him, I think, more credit than he gives himself. I, I think that there's also uh, a courage to that because so many people would write the melody in major and find that they like it and think that it's great and then yeah. not pause to say like, oh, well, you know, what if I did just tweak it a little bit? 
You know, <laughs> they, they would just be satisfied with the first draft. And I think that we know uh, one thing about Sondheim is that he is rarely, if ever, satisfied with the first draft. You know, he's a very iterative, right. thoughtful uh, artist who who goes about his work in a deliberate way. And because of that, you know, he's uh, he says he's a big procrastinator, but I, I have a feeling that uh, he, it just takes him a while to do these things sometimes. I mean, not to get too far away from it here, mm -hmm. for someone in a tree, why is it a song that you respect and like? Oh, for all those exact same reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if, I were, if, if we're sticking to a kind of orchestrational topic today, to me, this is the most like just tunic orchestration. You know, it's, it, it sure. sounds like it could be from another musical with only a few except i mean because you don't get like the shamisen or the uh hyoshigi or any of the japanese instruments um at least i don't think you do but what mm -hmm. you do get is something that i mentioned right at the beginning you get you get the big splashy xylophone moments when there's these big builds and i think that the builds themselves like that's a reason to love this song it's just like it's so steady, it's so chugging, and yet it's so ingratiating. Like you really get into the perspectives of these characters and then they build and they build and build and they come back down again. And just like at the end when they're all singing at the same time, boy, uh, what, yeah. what a cool effect. And, and also the imagery is just so poignant and, and it's so character driven. Maybe it's, you know, um, for, for these kind of minor characters, he, he really takes the time and consideration to color them, shall we say, in, in very individual strokes. You know, the samurai right. under the floorboards definitely has a different musical sound and lyrical sound than the, the little boy. What about you? Are you big into that song? I am. Um, it is the, the, it was the song that I was like almost immediately grabbed by mm -hmm. even on my first listen. And I've tried to understand why over the years, but I think it is it it is probably in part by the fact that I like Kurosawa so much. It's like, oh wait, this is kind of like Rashomon <laughs> when when I was listening to it the first time. So I came to Pacific Overtures. Actually, the first production I listened to was the the B D Wong version, so the two thousand four revival. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least that version of the song, I just love the ending of that. Right, the, those last three lines it crescendos into this like great moment, and it's just like, oh, this is so this is so good and so beautiful. I don't know, and it, it means a lot too, right? Like uh, to pull the curtain back, I've already recorded the episode mm -hmm. for someone in a tree, and that's a lot of the conversation. Is that it's interesting that what this song is really about is not about the event at all. No. Like no one really says anything about what happens <laughs> in the treaty house. It's all about like. Isn't it interesting to be part of history? Yeah, right. Uh, and, and and it's like, and some of them are like, they just so have to be okay with that. It's like, we're such a small bit of this whole grandiose story. Isn't that cool? And that's, an, I, this, I think, an interesting outlook on life. It's a little bit like how I saved Roosevelt from Assassins, <laughs> yeah, right, don't you right, think? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. And um, Assassins has already come up this, this season because there's, uh, I think that there's some actually interesting comparisons you can make specifically but like something just broke right right like the sure. other well, one it's the same book like, writer right john weidman well yeah yeah, yeah. Ex exactly so it might be something that he's just interested in is like that moment of like a huge historical thing happens mm -hmm. and it's like oh i was just like i was just washing dishes or it's like oh i was just like <laughs> stealing p uh, things from these clergymen over right. here uh, yes but it's like yeah, I'll never forget this moment when the world changed because I was just doing this thing that I wouldn't have thought twice about otherwise. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, 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 I've never really thought to compare those shows before, but of course the comparisons are obvious. I mean, I'm sure other people have compared yeah, yeah. them up and down. But right. the last like specific thing I just want to bring up, mm -hmm. and this seems to be like a recurring thing that I'm struggling with, and I, maybe I'm overthinking it. And it's, that's probably true that I'm overthinking it. Is the very last song called "Next." Mm -hmm. I would love you to tell me about like how why it's working the way it does as far as uh, music goes. But do you have a sense of like as an audience what we're supposed to feel from that song? Like, are we supposed to be like, yeah, Japan, or is was like, oh no, Japan? <laughs> like, do you have an idea for that? Yeah, it's funny. I was just listening to the episode that right. dropped today, um, yeah. which was about Chrysanthemum Tea. But you guys got into a, this this discussion. So I think you're supposed to feel a tremendous ambivalence and mm. you know that i mean and what what more sondheim <laughs> emotion to uh to feel <laughs> right right but yeah i mean you're supposed to feel the duality of somehow losing your culture and finding your culture and keeping your culture at the same time you know it, it's something that you guys brought up is that like 
Yes, East Asians are underrepresented in American culture and certainly were when the time that Pacific Overtures was written. And I know yeah. that you're going to have a, an episode or two and, you know, really kind of deconstruct this. But, um, you know, Japan is also like an imperialist conquering, right. you know, I mean, they, they're not the good guys necessarily. Yeah, ask, ask Korea how they feel about right, Japan. Yeah, ask right? Korea, yeah. ask Mongolia, <laughs> ask China. So, um, you know, I think that you have to sit with all of those things. And and it's not like, you know, it's not like Japan is not like a major contributor to global warming and uh, environmental right, degradation. Right. And yet they still find a place for reverence of nature and antiquity and all of these things in their society in, in almost a unique way among westernized cultures. I mean, oftentimes Japan is called a Western country. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's just looped in, uh, looped in with Europe, North America. And you, then people like add Japan in there, and it's got you know, even before they add South America. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's very interesting that. So, um, but I mean, how does that how does it musically work? I mean, you know, Sondheim refers to it as almost rock music. I mean, you know, <laughs> Sondheim says right. the strangest things about music sometimes. I mean, you know, he he has this whole thing. I know I've talked about it here before about how he says that uh, all popular music is is influenced by Ravel. It's like, buddy, <laughs> no, no, your largely unpopular music is very influenced by Ravel. That is not the basis of all <laughs> right, popular right, right. music. So when he calls next rock music, it's like, uh, okay, I mean, if that's what you think rock music sounds like. But the way that it does sound like rock music is you get the drum set. I mean, there, right. it's like it turns out that for the last two and a half hours, somebody's had a drum kit down there the whole time in the pit and they just, you know, bring it out for this last song. It's like, and, and meanwhile, you've had all these ladies, you know, female performers waiting down in the dressing room to come up yes. and do this one song. And so, I mean, what a way to make a point about modernity and the forward march of time and westernization in sort of inculcating itself into this Eastern culture. So um, from an orchestrational point of view, it's, it's, the thing to, to listen for in there is is the drum set, I think. That makes sense. What are some other things that you want to communicate about this score that I haven't asked about? You know, it's one thing I, I didn't mention when we were talking about Please Hello is I've always wondered, and I would love to ask Stephen Sondheim this, like, how did he come up with the Dutch music? You know, like, who, mm. I, look, I'm like a big classical music guy. I, I couldn't tell you like what is the stereotypical Dutch sound of music. Right. I mean, it's a little waltz, and he adds um, uh, tunic adds the woodblock in there, which I guess is supposed to be kind of like clogs, you know. Um, <laughs> right. But other than that, I mean, it's it's yeah. I, I've I've always been curious about that the style of the Dutch piece. I would just point out that I think that really the beautiful moments are the ones that you alluded to at the beginning of our conversation. The the slow ethereal ones, bowler hat. Pretty Lady, Poems, mm -hmm. um, There Is No Other Way. And I just think that that's neither Sondheim nor Tunic at their flashiest, but they certainly go deep on those songs. And they do so much. I mean, you know, the, the ethereal, high sounding strings of, of Pretty Lady. And mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. oh, and the little piccolo interludes in Bowler Hat. You know, it's just, it's, right. it's so next level. It's, it's just amazing. Well, Will, thank you so much for uh, talking a little bit more about this. If people wanted to hear more about you discussing music or follow you uh, with what you're doing, what's the best way to do so online? Yeah. Uh, if you just want to find me online, go to find me on Twitter at uh, Will C. White. And if you want to hear me jabber my mouth off a little bit more about uh, musical topics, you can listen to my podcast, which is called The Classical Gab Fest. It's a weekly discussion about classical music and the world of classical music uh to me and two of my very good buddies who are also conductors please give it a listen for you specifically as a conductor have there been any uh, talks about returning back into in-person conducting at all yeah or? i've been i've been uh so i did do a project earlier in the summer where i i conduct a basically an oratorio society in seattle mm -hmm. and we did do a summer messiah project outside um, we did a very truncated version of Handel's Messiah. And mm -hmm. now we're in rehearsals for our second concert of the summer, which is going to be inside. Very exciting. Um, so things are things are on the move here. And and right now, as of now, I'm planning a full normal season for 2021-22, which my fingers are very much crossed for. So <laughs> I think I think it might actually happen. It's 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 uh it's a thrilling time to be 
to be planning again yes. for the resumption of, of musical activity. That's exciting. Perfect. Well, thanks, Will. Yeah, my pleasure, Kyle. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network, to Pod Power, and to ATB this week. Putting It Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we'll be coming back to talking about individual songs with poems. You haven't noticed, but this entire episode was spoken in haiku. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now. <laughs>